Halito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native culture, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And I hope you'll do me a favor. Feel free to like and share these episodes. I so appreciate it. Yakuki. I am more than a maker. I'm more than an outdoorsman. More than a protector. Than a graduate. Than a princess. An athlete. A pastor. I'm more than a warrior. Chata ilifinachili. Chata ilifinachili. I am Choctaw proud. I am Choctaw proud. I am Choctaw proud. We are the Choctaw Nation, and together we're more. You're listening to part two of this series. Paula, most people in the Choctaw Nation know you and know who you are. And you and Cheryl are well respected in the community. But I know there are many out there who still haven't heard about your journey. And it's an important one to hear. Did you know any of your great grandparents? The only one would just be my grandmother. And uh, it was it would be her parents that would uh, walk the trail of tears. And, and isn't that crazy? You're just that closely that removed close, from that? Yes. And and it was hers, and they're the original. My grandmother's the original enrollee. What was so painful was that her parents both died, and her aunt raised her. And uh, she was two years old when they both passed away. So she would never talk about her uh, upbringing. Mm. I think it was just too painful. too painful. She never once, I even asked my mother, about her aunt and she couldn't tell me anything because she didn't even tell her anything we, you know we we always thought maybe it was just too painful to talk about mm -hmm. and, and a lot of Indian people are that way but my grandmother was the most industrious person I ever met in my whole life she could make anything that we needed and she lived with my uncle and my aunt and I always tell this, and it's the truth. She could make a chicken coop. She could make a wheelbarrow. <laughs> she had a huge garden. But we helped her with it. As little as, as I mean, a younger, uh, I was five years old, and yet I remember those things. She even raised peanuts, and she would have us pull them out of the ground and lay it down for it to dry. No I remember doing that. She had big old cornfield. Uh, she raised everything. Huh. She had that garden just, of course my aunt and uncle helped her, you know, yeah. chop it and, and take the weeds out and stuff. But she did most of the work. Mm. She was out there from dawn to wow. dusk in the spring, you know, and in the summer and can everything. She <laughs> had made this wheelbarrow and we don't know where she got the wheel in the front. We never did know. <laughs> Probably out there in the field somewhere, some farmer left it or something. Yeah. But she made this wheelbarrow. So she, that day, she said, now you're going to, I'm going to go up the hill. She didn't tell us what she was doing. But she said, what I want you to do is to uh, bring all the corn shucks and with the uh, silk and all. Mm -hmm. So we had to load that wheelbarrow up with all of it and push it up the hill to an abandoned church house. Okay. So we'd push that up there and leave it there, then come back down and get some more until she had a big old pile. She okay. saved it for a purpose we didn't know. Right. So then, uh, I guess just out of curiosity, we she would never let you see what she was doing. That was just one of the Indian ways that, that we have. <laughs> anyway, my mother was like that. Grandma too. was like but that. <laughs> she had pulled the planks in the middle of that abandoned church house, she pulled the planks in the middle. Okay. And uh, she was digging. She made a big old square. She dug, uh, I can't even remember a shovel. It looks to me like it was just a sharp piece of wood or something, but she uh, dug all the dirt out of it. And then what she used the shucks was to line it up. We didn't know she was making a cellar. She put all of her 
canned goods now. We had to go walk back down to the house and load it up and we had to be very careful because they're jars. Mm, and true. we remember, I remember that push a help and I'm just five years old and we'd push it up there and she lined them up all in there and then she uh, uh, put the silk, the corn shucks all over it. Wow. And then she put the planks back and uh, you could never tell there was anything in there. So that was her cellar and nobody could know what anything was in there. She was so creative. How close did you live to her? We lived across the field, across the road. Mm. It probably was like a mile and a half or so, but we would all walk up there because she lived with my aunt and uncle and uh, we had our own little house. Mm. Uh, they, my grandmother had all her children living close by her at that time because my Aunt Rebecca lived about two miles from her and my Aunt Mary lived that far too. So okay. she had one son and two daughters, three daughters, I'm sorry. I assume that you all may have lived on land allotments at that time? No, these, these were not at ours at all. These were rented places. Mm, okay. And uh, the allotments were, you know, far. They were in another county. What county was it? Uh, ours, my, my dad's was in Carter County. Hmm. It's 160 acres allotment surface, 40, 40 acre surface. So, you know, it's funny that the government would uh, give how, I'd like to know how, but 160 acres was in Carter County and 40 acres was in Cole County, just the surface. Yeah. That's... How did they do that? You know, <laughs> our last name is Chafatabi. Chaf Chaf mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Chafatabi Noah. And uh, they, the government didn't change his name during Dawes Commission Rolls 1904 and 5. It was closed in 5. Well, they gave, they didn't take his name away, thank God. Yeah. So my great grandfather's name is uh, Chafata Binoa. Translated, that means uh, go and kill one. Chafa Ia Chaabi means go and kill one. Okay. So we always thought, surely it was an animal and not a human person. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but Noah means what? walk. Walk. Walking. Walk. walk. Oh. So, so go, mm -hmm. go uh, walk and kill one, really, if you're going to say it. So, yeah, what was the story behind that, I wonder? Uh, yeah, that's what we all wonder. Yeah, all of the, the Choctaw uh, last names ended with Abi, means kill. Mm -hmm. There's a Maitabi, there's a Mashintabi, Mashaiya Go over there and kill one. All of his stories behind it, but all of them's got that Abi. I went to a Mississippi genealogy and try to find out if we have any more relatives in our homeland, mm. Chafatabi, the Noahs. And uh, I haven't heard from them yet, but there is a reservation uh, over there uh, in Memphis, not far from the Elvis uh, mansion. It's not far from there. And it's, uh, I've seen that turn off and I wondered where it went to, but if you keep going there, there's another reservation there. And some of our people said they found their relatives there. Really? I've never been there. We've been oh. everywhere else, but they're not love to go see it. So tell us about your grandparents. What were they like? Uh, just that she's the all we had. We she, had no okay. grandfather. Yeah. They all passed away. Or my grandmother uh, did have, she, she was married, but she divorced him because he was so abusive oh. and she never married again. Okay. She stayed single the rest of her life. She was done. Uh-huh. She's over there making her cellar. <laughs> <laughs> great, great spirit, our ancestors called God, great spirit. But, you know, if you read in the Bible about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit spoke to our people to help them because the Bible says he's a helper. And I often wonder if he was the one that helped our people, you know, to, yeah. to find ways to, uh, you know, plant and and uh, and survive in this weather and survive yes. on this planet the way they did mm -hmm. so we don't know that exactly but it sounds like the creator god yeah. did have a part in their survival 
What would you like the listeners to know about your family history and stories? Well, my mother couldn't speak English. She, uh, uh, she was raised, you know, our, our home was nothing but uh, culture and our traditions. And we lived in Cairo out in the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mother was just, just really uh, learned so many things from my grandmother that they it, I, it was hard to tell them apart because my mother was also very zealous and very uh, industrious herself. Yeah. She never, everything she did, I mean, for survival. Uh, sometimes we didn't have food in the house, but uh, maybe a little flour and a little water from the, the creek. And she would put that together and make us biscuits and tell us to go out in the woods and find onions, wild onions. So we would eat that uh, biscuit with our onions. Yeah. And uh, it's just little things like that that I remember so well. Mm. And if you say you don't have any food, you've got something in your cabinet, but we didn't. And right. uh, that that's that was right after uh, World War II. See, that's when I was born, 1940. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, they had rations and stamps and things that they gave for to, to buy groceries and uh, back then you know there was not that much food thank and, goodness uh, your mom knew how to live off she knew how to do all that yeah. she was a survivor she could cook outside and cook a meal outside oh, yeah amazing. so you know basically they all could do that together and there were families that lived across the creek and then some across the road. And Mary Snell in that picture right there, she lived not too far from us and they lived like that too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my mother was quite a, quite a lady. How would you describe full her? Blood. Like strong? Child? Strong, yes. She's half chicks on, half chopped off, full blood. Mm-hmm. And a very strong person. And she spoke Choctaw, not Chickasaw, correct? I she mean, speak a little bit of Chickasaw, but okay. mostly Choctaw. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so was it her, who was who was the Chickasaw side for her? and who was Her father. Chickasaw? Okay. Uh-huh. So her father was full-blood Chickasaw, and then her mother was full-blood uh-huh. Choctaw, probably? Yes, he was mostly Chickasaw, but he was some Choctaw, too. Okay. Yeah. So she was half and half, I believe. So is your citizenship, is it in Choctaw or in Chickasaw Nation? Mine's Choctaw. Okay. I'm but, Chickasaw. Okay. Oh, well, well, I have been half and you, can relinquish, you, know, you can relinquish either one if you're half and half. So all my children uh, uh, relinquished Choctaw and did Chickasaw. And they had a, a very good reason. It was for education purposes. Chickasaw oh. pays a whole lot more really? for education than Choctaw does. Okay. And uh, I said that one. real bad. You and Mark. I mean, oh, Mark, my, my oldest son, he oh. said, Mama, I won't tra- be a traitor. He said, I'll be chopped off with you the rest of my life. So, <laughs> so the two Choctaws in our, yeah, our family. Is, right? <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us are chicken sauce. But they yeah. wanted to earn their degrees. And Sherry holds two degrees uh, from two different universities there. So she got help with chicken sauce. That's great. Where Choctaw just it's been the same for years years <laughs> and i talked to our chief about it and i said now look here i said we need to up our educational <laughs> we need to up that that school, school. Education. And he said miss Carney, we're working on it that's been years 25 years ago <laughs> <laughs> been working on it <laughs> so you we'll be back after this quick break Are you in the medical field looking for your next opportunity? Listeners, I'm proud to introduce you to Native American veteran-owned staffing company, Worldwide Medical Staffing. Owner and CEO Jackson Weaver is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and is a service-connected disabled veteran where he and his team staff for commercial healthcare and government entities, such as the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and DHS, and specialize in staffing Indian Health and VA hospitals nationwide. Isn't it nice to know that our veterans are being cared for by staff who have been handpicked by a veteran who's been in the staffing business for 17 years? 
healthcare job seekers, check out these open jobs on www.medical.com. If you're seeking temporary, long-term, or permanent placement of physicians, advanced practice, registered nurses, and more, check out www.medical.com. And Yako Ki to our medical professionals and to those who have served our country. So, Cheryl, when you speak, are you speaking typically Choctaw only yes. or yeah. no Chickasaw? Because, no. Yeah. Uh, when I was little, the only Chickasaw that we heard was my grandpa. Mm -hmm. And he was, okay. he was Chickasaw, oh, so he spoke, he spoke Chickasaw. Okay. So mom, mom, she can understand Chickasaw anyway because yeah. they're they're so, so similar, they're so right? similar. Yeah, they're like eighty percent similar. So. Okay. So Vina is was your mother, uh -huh. correct? Um, and she was born in nineteen thirteen and passed in nineteen ninety seven. Uh -huh. That's correct. Right. That's right. Um, so she originally married a man named Joseph William Wilson, Wilson. correct? Wilson. Joseph uh -huh. Wilson. Okay. And do you remember anything about him at all? He was a wonderful man. Oh. He, uh, he's the one that gave me his name, and uh, uh, he, uh, he was educated. Some, while the rest of them, you know, just didn't have an opportunity to go to school. I think mm -hmm. mother went, my mama went second grade or something, but he was very educated, and uh, he didn't have any family. Hmm. So he gave my sister and I his name, wow. and uh, so that's that's the story there. But he passed away in 1946. I was six years old when he died. Oh. So uh, he had tuberculosis, and that's what took his life. We knew that. So common back then. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So he didn't have any family at all. All his family were passed away. Oh. And then, and then Vina later marries uh, Frank Carpenter, Carpenter correct? Uh -huh. Yes. And so he was your stepdad, and he yes. was the Chickasaw one. Yes. What What was Frank like? Oh, he he was a <laughs> he was quite oh. a character. <laughs> he, he, uh, he was a good man until he had alcohol in him, and then it was not a good man. <laughs> he uh, he had very you know issues about that, and. Uh, he lived that life with us, and uh, it was not a very good life. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we didn't know that later on in life he would become a Christian, and made the best grandpa in the whole world. Aww. But he was later, way later. Yes. But he uh, was thrown out of his home when he was eleven or twelve years old. And uh, he just made his way in, in life, and and we don't know all his insecurities and why he did what he did. Sure. But uh, he definitely was a hard worker, though. He worked hard, drank most of his monies up. Yeah, uh, he'd tell me stories. Or well, tell us stories about him uh, driving a coal truck, and he delivered coal. And uh, that's that. He'd always tell us, you know, different stories about that. How many sisters and step siblings do you have? Two half sisters, and uh, uh, I, that, that was three of us. And my mother had three three girls, mm -hmm. and then uh, my dad had six children. He had three girls and three boys. So, but my sister had already been out of the house when when they met. Oh, okay. So you know, only and. Uh, so my sister Mary Jane and I were the only two at home still when when they got together. So you grew up in Cairo, uh -huh. correct? Uh-huh. Yeah. To, uh, to about five years old. And what was Cairo like then? It's just country. There's country. nothing there but a school and a little, little candy store oh, all of those that. years. Yeah. And it never did develop into anything else. But it's still Cairo. Uh, they yeah. don't have a post office or one. They don't have anything <laughs> in the school. It's a little community. It's a little community. Right. And the little schoolhouse is still there and it's about ready to, uh, it's old. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, the volunteer fire, the volunteer oh, fire, they, they have a building. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Oh, <laughs> that's all that's, that's out there. Yeah. <laughs> Did you go to the candy store? Yes. Mr. and Miss Delbert Sherman on that candy store and. uh, Gladys and, and he, that's was a school teacher. 
and uh, but he ran the store. What was your favorite candy you remember? Oh my goodness, a box of Honest Snuff. And, Honest Snuff? Uh, I like the peanuts that's in it. But <laughs> than that, I like the money that's down the bottom of that Honest Snuff. Oh. <laughs> it was a, a little, that's what it was called, uh -huh. right? And uh -huh. it was candy. Uh -huh. <laughs> was there anything else that you remember about your early life prior to going to Wheelock Academy? Not too much. We just lived out in the country like everybody else, you know, and no water. I remember that house we lived in had no water, uh, no convenience at all. Mm -hmm. Just a house out there, and it, it finally they finally tore it down. But uh, that's where we lived, and that's where the the lady came to take us to the boarding school. Mm -hmm. So after that, I don't remember anything else there. Yeah. Because I don't know what, life changing. Uh -huh. So my mother, they moved to town or, you know, lived here somewhere. And, uh, but we were there at the boarding school all year. Mm. And we hardly ever came home. You were young when that happened. Oh, real young. So I was young. only, my goodness, I think third grade or so. Yeah. And they did have public school here in Colgate and we could catch the bus and come in. And there were two of them, Grant School and Lee School, where the nursing home is today. So I went to Lee and my sister went to Grant. That's what's interesting to me, and we're about to talk about the story of you heading off to Wheelock, but they had to take you out of your home to go to school mm -hmm. instead of just letting you continue to live in your home and go to That's the public right. school. Unbelievable. And, uh, that was strange because they didn't take every child out of their homes. Right. And they just targeted us. And, uh, they wanted to change you and that's get it. you away from your that's right and from our environment and, and the government had a plan all right yes they did and we weren't the only ones because you know the schools had lots of other children there you know that mm -hmm. they took out of their homes oh, now what's worse when i got to shilaco they would bus the navajo children from off the reservation and you know i was just a god wow old uh, 13 or so, but I could hear those children just crying, those little Navajo kids, mm -hmm. and they were just like five and six years old, just crying, or getting off that bus. It was just a child, and I, you know, I, myself, 13 years old, 12, 13 years old, and I, I used to think that was so terrible, but I did that at Wheelock, so I you guess knew just, what it was you like. know, pain was there, and and uh, you couldn't hurt us anymore. So maybe that's why we, you know, but they would just drop them off. Those little kids be getting off that bus crying. Oh. They basically, in a way, made it, made it probably feel like you all were orphans, maybe, you know, no more mom and dad, uh -uh. just done with your family. That's oh. terrible. And that, that school right there at Shalop, it's in, in the middle of that campus, and it could hold 500, and there was 500 Navajo children at Shilako. They could not speak English at all. Uh-uh. Devastating. And think of how much it even cost the government to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but they thought they, they were getting ahead of the problem. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. It was uh -huh. two it. different nations trying mm -hmm. to live uh -huh. in the same country. Yes. Mm -hmm. And after all, they took all the land, you know, and, right. and they're trying to change us. And, we were definitely brainwashed. We really were in Wheelock. Mm -hmm. Now, Shilaka wasn't too bad, but there was lots of things there that wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting when someone goes through trauma, you know, we've all probably been through a little bit of trauma in our lifetime, some more than others, of course. And sometimes I think you step back and go, wait, did that just happen to me? Did What happened? What, what was right? Mm -hmm. What was wrong? Mm -hmm. Do you ever at this age still Absolutely. struggle with that? Exactly. And I used to wonder, well, what's wrong with us? Hmm. You know, and we were just like at the culture, and they have it on a plaque, and I said it. Uh, they told us, you know, you're in a white man's, white man's world now. You're not Indian anymore. So I thought, well, I love being Indian. What's wrong with being Indian? I was just a little girl, just a little girl. But I was thinking that, what's wrong with being an Indian? I love it, yeah. our Indian ways, you know, and then they were changing us. Mm -hmm. But they brainwashed us. 
And you know, if uh, you know, you don't even remember that. You don't even know why. But we all lived in fear mm -hmm. because they punish us, and it was mm -hmm. cruel. They they gave demerits, and they had a big old board out there, and and if you did anything, that was one. And then you know, when you get to four and you slash it, and you have five. There was severe punishment for those. So we we lived in fear. Like if I do something, they're gonna I'm gonna get another demerit. How sad for any child to live. Like exactly. That. And then the big thing was, uh, you're lonely as it is, but if you got that five, you had to stay in your room while they had a movie at the school. Or you got to do a little something outside of the stuff that was normally done routine, and you couldn't go. So you're one And that lonely, lonely, lonely on. was in that room. Oh. And that, that's, that's terrible to a child that way. It really is. But that was another form of punishment. So, you know, at the time, you're just a child. You don't know anything much, you know. The interesting thing about when I first met y'all at the Echo premiere, you both were just a bright light. It was a long day. We were all tired. <laughs> and y'all were still going strong. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> and just like my great-grandmother, she was always so kind and sweet and had this beautiful countenance like y'all do and i would never Aww. know that this was in your you know your your mother faced this your faith i would assume is, it a is. part of that that's it i always mm -hmm. tell people that in psalms it says that god is our refuge our fortress our strength and uh i just read that over and over and he is definitely what he said he is he yes, is he our is. fortress he's mm -hmm. our strength he's our refuge uh, he's our fortress somewhere we can uh, lean on and a friend in time and, uh, of trouble. Oh, yes, God. so we we do that. Do you feel like the, the hymns were influential when you were in the in the boarding schools? Or? Yes, even so, even if they told us we couldn't sing or speak, you know, some of us were stubborn, mm -hmm. and we sung it anyway. And Got since it. we could speak, we knew what those words meant. Yeah. And at just about every hymn is it, there's a message in there of hope and uh, of how big God is, the greatness of God. Uh, there are just so many things in there that are meaningful, the real meaning of life. And it's in there, if you if you sing it, you know, you feel it. Oh yeah. That's right. It's, it's interesting how we just hear um, hymns at church, songs mm -hmm. at church. Mm -hmm. This took hymns to a whole other level, knowing that mm -hmm. they could give you some strength and um, carried you through some hard times, who would think that a song could make you be strong? That's right, that's Amazing. right. But the, the Choctaw words are very meaningful and it's deeply, deeply said. You could say some words and it would not, not mean near yeah. in English, near, uh, oh. the reality of it and the right. uh -huh, how you really feel. It, you can't even do that with the English words. Mm. So that's why it's so meaningful. I love yeah. that. It's wonderful. It goes into depth. And yeah, it does. That's what yeah. I'm trying to use. The chunk word. of words go into depth. And Interesting. Rather than, you know, English kind of cuts things off, you know. But okay. when you, you know, when it's the language, Choctaw language, or probably any tribe, uh, uh, tribal language, you know, it just, that's why, that's how we can explain things and mm -hmm. describe things because we, there's not always a word for the English word, so we have to, it's mom, right. we always go to mom, <laughs> describe it, to mom. What, what's, the, what's the word for this, you know, and she said, there's really not a word, we just have to describe it, so we're used to describing, and so, yeah, I know it's, it's descriptive, descriptive. Yes. Yeah, there's no, there's no word for, you know, like telephone, or there's no words for, yes. you know, a lot of things, well, so, the hymn number 47 is our Easter song, yeah, and when you sing that, you eyes can't hardly sing it. Oh, it gets you, huh? It tells exactly how Jesus suffered. It tells everything that happened mm. in that one hymn. Stay tuned for part three of this series. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>